that day. Hallelujah. I'm reading from Mark chapter 11, verse 1 to 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 1 to 11. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Lose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately, he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street. And they lose it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing losing the court? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the court to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and sat, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which is settled forever in heaven, the word which you use to create heavens and earth and everything that inhabits it. That word is forever settled in heaven. That word is equal to Jesus. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Father, we pray that even as your word comes, you will grant utterance. And I pray that, Lord, your word will accomplish that for which it was sent today. Bring deliverance to your people. Put our hearts to a place where we will forever worship and praise you. And to thank you for all that you've done for us. May your name be praised. May the anointing in your word break every yoke and set the captives free. May the anointing in your word heal every disease and discomfort, even that is represented in this room by the mighty release of the anointing of Christ, the healer. I thank you and I bless you that any power of the enemy be broken by the anointing in the mighty name of Jesus. And set your people free, for whom you set free is free indeed. We declare today, that you are the one who sets us free, and we will walk in the freedom that you have set us. We glorify and magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We bless God for today. I want you to prepare your heart to hear the word. The word sets you free. Amen. The word can heal you. He sent his word and healed their diseases. And so wherever the word is preached, you have to pay attention, and you have to ask God to give you understanding. Hallelujah. The Bible says that in all you're getting, get understanding. Get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Hallelujah. Shall we please stand and say these things by faith? My God is a good God. God loved me even when I was a sinner and sent his son, Jesus, to die for me. I take hold of the love of God and accept Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. God has delivered me from the power of darkness. Now I am part of God's kingdom, the kingdom of light. I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. God has imputed the righteousness of Christ on me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise 
shall continually be in my mouth. The Lord is my source. My help is in the name of the Lord. The blessing of Abraham is upon me. I will make progress in all areas of my life. This year, I take hold of God's divine grace for progress. My spiritual progress will be evident to all. This will be the doing of the Lord, and it will be marvelous. I position myself for divine increase. I position myself for divine progress. I position myself for divine health. I position myself for divine protection. I position myself for divine provision. The oil of joy is poured upon my life, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord is the strength of my life. Jesus became sick with all my sicknesses, and so I am healed. Hosanna in the highest. I believe, therefore I receive. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we say what you have said concerning us by faith, activating your word, for all your promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. And as we say them by faith, and as we believe them, and as we take hold of the truth of the word of God, may they come to pass, even in our individual lives. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May we be seated, please. Amen. Now, speaking to the topic, Jesus' final entry into Jerusalem. His final entry into Jerusalem, or the final entry into Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Last week, we talked about um, something that happened on Jesus' way to Jerusalem. And... uh, We are saying the final entry into Jerusalem because this occurrence is not the last, the first time that Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He had been there several times. And uh, as the Jewish custom was or is, every adult is supposed to go to, go up to Jerusalem on those major festive occasions like the tabernacle like uh, the Passover, every lawyer Jewish person has to go up to Jerusalem. And so Jesus had gone to Jerusalem several times, but this was the final one. I said last week that when, by divine revelation, Peter was able to identify Jesus as the Messiah because he said, who do people say I am? And he said, one of the prophets, blah, 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 those things. And then he said, but who do you say I am? And Peter said that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He said that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. So that was calling Jesus the Messiah, the Christ. Hallelujah. And so he started telling them how he had to go to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, how they were going to arrest him how they were going to hand him over to the Gentiles, and how they were going to crucify him, but on the third day, he will rise again. So he started on three occasions on his way to Jerusalem. He told them this same thing, predicted his death. You remember one of those occasions? Peter said, no, this will never happen to you. He said, get behind me, Satan. I was born to die. Hallelujah. That was his purpose of coming. And so... Last week I said on his way to Jerusalem, there was this blind man, Bartimaeus, who was sitting by the roadside and begging for arms. And then when he heard that Jesus was passing by, he started yelling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people said, shut up, man, you blind man. But nobody could stop him from yelling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
and he drew Jesus' attention. Wherever faith is released, the attention of Jesus is present. The miracles of God are just like a magnet. They are looking for where faith is. And when faith is identified, faith draws the miracles of God. And so this man who couldn't be stopped, those who were yelling to him to keep quiet, when Jesus, when he got Jesus' attention, they told the man, hey, my man, be of good cheer. The master is calling you. And they started giving way for him to go to the master. Hallelujah. Now, if you are here and you have been crying to God for help, and people are making mockery of you, don't stop until you get Jesus' attention. Because when you get his attention, your trouble will be over. And those who try to shut you down and to stop you from serving your God and believing him, they will be the people to say that, wow, look at what God can do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So don't keep asking for God's attention. He will, you will get his attention one of these days. And you will glorify his name. Hallelujah. But before he went to Jesus, he had a clock of the beggar's clock. He threw it away. It was a hindrance. So he threw it away, went to Jesus, and received his sight. Now, all the four Gospels talk about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all talk about that. And three of them talk about Jesus sitting on a court. Only one of the Gospels talk about a donkey. Amen. Amen. Now, point number one, sent with specific instructions. Jesus sent two of his disciples with specific instructions. Verse 11 of Mark chapter 11 says, verse 1 to 3 says that, Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite to you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a cold tide, on which no one has sat. Lose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately, he will send it here. Hallelujah. So we are talking about the Mount of Olives. Very significant to Jewish history and the end tide. Now, my question to you, which you are free to raise your hand and tell me, is that what do you remember about the Mount of Olives? What do you remember about the Mount of Olives? If you were in the first service, don't raise your hand. I won't call you. You can raise your hand. This, this free assembly, you know. Yes. So, at his second coming, his foot shall step on Mount Olives. And the Bible says that when his feet steps on that mountain, it's going to open into two. And as Isaiah says, except the Lord has left for us a remnant, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. During the battle of Armageddon, when Jesus comes and his feet steps on that mountain, it will break into two. And the Jewish people that God has set as a remnant, for himself, will have to pass through into safety. So that's Mount Olives. What else do you believe? Do, do you know about Mount Olives? Anybody here? Yes. Ah, uh, the, the transfiguration took place on Mount Olives. You sure on it? Mount Olives. Uh, all right, we, we will look into that. <laughs> all right. We, we, we also know that that is where Jesus ascended into heaven. 
the Bible says that ye men of Galilee, why are ye standing here gazing into heaven, this same Jesus, who you see go into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. Hallelujah. And Mount Olives is the most expensive place on earth because um, the, the, if you go there, you will see some kind of um, pottery that they keep the bones of people in there, and you have to buy a space. And they pay so much money because they believe that that is where Jesus will come and if your bones are there, you'll be among the first who will resurrect and go with Christ. So people are prepared to pay so much money wherever they are to send their bones to Mount Olives so that they will be among the first to go with Jesus. And I told the first service, I don't even care where my bones will be <laughs> because wherever I will be, I will be changed in a twinkling of an eye and I will meet the Lord in the, the, Lord in the sky. Hallelujah. So that's number one. And uh, we realize that Jesus told the disciples, the two of them, go to the city opposite and you will find a colt. That is tied. A colt is a young horse. In fact, it's only in Matthew that he says Jesus sat on two animals, which is not possible. A colt and a donkey, the fall of a donkey. Now, a colt is a young horse. And a young horse is free in spirit. It jumps around, you know, joyfully around, galloping around freely. But this colt was tied and couldn't run around freely. Hallelujah. In the same way, there are believers who are bound, and so they cannot enjoy their freedom. There are people who are bound by sin. They are bound by their past, and so they cannot enjoy their freedom. Today, Jesus is here to set you free. And to break every yoke that is keeping you from enjoying life to the fullest. He came to set the captives free. It doesn't matter what you have done in the past. The vilest offender who truly believes, the Bible says, that moment from Jesus, a pardon is received. And so he told them, untie him and bring it. And then he said that if they ask you, why are you doing this? Why are you untying this? Tell them that the master has need of it. You see, Jesus has done a lot for us because he wants to use us as a trophy. Just like he used the nation of Israel as a trophy. He blessed the nation of Israel. If he told them, if you follow my, uh, my directions and follow my laws and precepts, I will bless you. And I will use you to bless other nations. And so... If Israel had obeyed God, no nation would have been able to conquer Israel because God promised to use them as a trophy. In the same way, if you can only obey God and serve him faithfully, God wants to use you as a trophy. In your family, he wants to use you as the only one that people will look at and see that there is a blessing on this person. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that those who don't know the Lord will look at you and give praise to God. He wants to use you as a trophy. Wherever you find yourself, at your workplace, where there is difficulty, God wants to use you to the point that what people cannot solve, you go there and God will give you the grace to solve that problem. The patient who is so difficult, no nurse wants to go to, you go there and somehow God grants you the grace. And your presence brings calmness to the person. Hallelujah. And then why did the people not question them to say that, why are you tying the, untying the donkey? Stop what you are doing or fight with them or something. Some theologians say that Jesus had prearranged for the use of the cult. So he had told the owners that 
somehow on this day I will be passing to Jerusalem and I will need a cult and I know you have a cult here. So when I get here, I will send two of my disciples to come and untie the cult. And so when they are untying them, let them untie the cult and bring it. I don't believe that was the case. But whether it was even the case, I believe that Jesus can physically or spiritually prearrange for the use of the cult. Hallelujah. So spiritually, the Bible says that the heart of the king is in God's hands and he can turn it whichever way he wants. So God can spiritually let the people in their hearts not give hard time to the two disciples when Jesus needs the cult. Amen. Do you know that God has prearranged your life that when this life is over, you go and enjoy eternity with him? That's prearrangement. I told the first service that when I was in Botswana, I finished school, my master's, and I was applying for jobs. And I applied for so many jobs to the point that when they called me for interview, I had forgotten the kind of job they called me interview for. They called that company work improvement teams. Our job was to go to a company. It was a government job. You go to a company, like one project that we did, uh, the hospital, we realized that when people uh, go see the doctor, by the time they get their medication and leave the hospital, they spend about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So our job was to go there and reduce the waiting time to about 15 minutes. So that was the job. We call it work improvement teams. We, for instance, we'll say that at the government offices, when the phone rings, it shouldn't ring more than three times for somebody to pick it up. Or if somebody needs a license, they apply, it shouldn't take three days for them to get their license unless there is a very special issue over there. So that's what we did. So they called me for interview. And I didn't know what I was going for interview. I didn't know the kind of job I applied for. But I just went. And so when I went there, they, they asked me, what does WIT, they call the, the short form, you know, in America, they use acronyms, you know, like short forms of stuff, like DOJ, Department of Justice. If you don't know anything they are talking about, they say DOJ. You say, what is DOJ? It's <laughs> Department of Justice. So WITS means that work improvement teams. And I went for this interview, and the guy asked me, what is WITS? I didn't know. I didn't get ready. I said, I don't know. The guy looked at me, how can you come for an interview and you don't know what you are coming for? I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay. They asked me certain other questions. Um, they asked me about my life. I told them my life story and everything. I finished the interview and I went home. I knew I wasn't going to be given the job. Then they called me. They called me and they said that we offered you the job. What? So I waited till I went to work and I got to know my boss very well. So I asked him, why did you give me the job? They said that, well, the first question we asked you, you didn't know wh why you were here. <laughs> but we realized from your story that you could be a ver the best fit. And apart from that, all those who came after you for the interview, they didn't do well. You did better than all of them. I said, what? <laughs> that was a prearrangement by God. Yeah. You know? The reason why I call it prearrangement was that, number one, I wasn't fit because I didn't prepare. But I was able to convince them based on other stuff. And God prearranged that all those who went for that job interview, they didn't do well. So I had to shine. I had to get a job. That was a prearrangement. And I can assure you if you, to, if you will serve the God faithfully and trust the Lord, he will prearrange for everything for you. Yeah. Hallelujah. He breaks protocol. 
Watch people have to wait. You see? Oh, my God. You see, when you get your green card, how long does it get to get you? How, how long do you have to stay to get your citizenship? They say five years, eh? I know somebody, they got their green card today. How many weeks? The same day, they schedule for interview for her to get her citizenship. With my two eyes, I can look at the person. <laughs> Hallelujah. So God can pre-arrange for your progress, your success, your breakthrough, if you will serve him faithfully. Some of us, our marriages were prearranged. Hallelujah. And your success has been prearranged. You sit down here, you think you are not making it. God has fixed it already. He got it all together. You think you are sick, you are never going to be healed, or those kind of stuff. You go to the hospital, the doctors don't even know what they are doing, that kind of thing. Your success, your healing, your deliverance has already been prearranged. But you have to do it in God's way, God's principle. Don't use any crooked way. God doesn't like ugly. If you go before God, the prearrangement will not work. Hallelujah. So our lives are prearranged. Just like Jesus prearranged. Hallelujah. I am here to tell you that it doesn't matter. Jesus, the master, says that when you get to know the truth, the truth will set you free. And you don't have to be bound by your shame, your guilt, your failures, or your family background in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus told them that when they ask you, tell them that Jesus has need of the cause, and they will let you bring him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know you can serve God better when you are not tired than when you are tired? So God wants you to serve him better. So he sends his message to set you free so you can worship him better. While we were praising God and worshiping God, if your hands were tired, how could you clap your hands? If something is on your mind and beating you down and that kind of thing, if you were sick in your body, how could you come here to worship the Lord? So it is for freedom that he set us free. Hallelujah. By the authority of scripture and the power in the Christ and his anointing, I untie you for the use of the master. May the anointing break any yoke of bondage, any spiritual hindrance to your progress in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible says that no one has sat on that cause. Now, for a horse to be used, to be sat on, you have to teach the horse. You have to break the horse. Wild horses cannot be sat on because they have not been trained. They have not been um, broken. You have, if you don't break a horse, a wild, wild horse, it will kick you. Or it jump around so much, you will fall from it. But if you break it, if you teach it, then it will be calm. And take you wherever you want. And you have to put um, bits in its mouth to break it. To control the behavior of that. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says that this cult that Jesus asked them to go and untie, no one has sat on it. And so if no one has sat on it, we don't expect Jesus to be able to comfortably. I mean, the, the, a cult that is not uh, broken or not trained, you put your your, your coat on it, it will run away. It will run from behind, uh, under you. But we are talking about the master. Hallelujah. He who spoke to the storm to be still. He who cursed the fig tree and it died. This is the master who needs the cult. And so the cult came here for Jesus to sit on. Nobody had trained the cult. Nobody had broken the, the, the cult. But the cult was so calm because the master has need of it. Humbled himself for the master to sit on. And they put a red carpet for Jesus and for the horse to walk on. Lapa on the ground. 
branches on the ground. And the unbroken horse was able to walk on it majestically with the master sitting on it. And a lot of noise. Think about it. A wild horse making noise around a wild horse. It will gallop away. But the master had control. It doesn't matter the storm in your life. If you invite the master into your situation, every storm will be still in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter if that storm has no name, whether your sickness has no name, whether the doctor couldn't even find what is wrong with you. The master, when he comes into the situation, your trouble will be quiet in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He controlled the storm. He said the, the, he, he he said boundaries for the fig tree. He said boundaries. He said no one is going to eat fruit from you anymore from this moment. Hallelujah. Diseases obeyed him. Demons had to obey him. Hallelujah. And God has need of you. And no one can stop it. Hallelujah. Why did Christ sit on a cross and not a horse? Anyone sitting on a horse is a position of authority, it's a position of power. And the, the, the Jewish people were expecting a conquering Messiah who is going to conquer the Roman Empire and give them freedom. But that was not the kind of Messiah Jesus was. He was the suffering servant of the Lord. He was born to die a shameful death because he took upon himself our sins and our sicknesses, our pain and our sufferings, everything he had to carry them. Hallelujah. And so he had to humble himself and go into Jerusalem as the suffering servant of the Lord, not a majestic conqueror. Hallelujah. On this occasion, Jesus, we know that in his ministry, he will heal the sick, and then he will tell them, don't tell anybody that Christ, I am the Messiah. He said it so many times. Whenever the people were making noise about him, they wanted to crown him as the king, he would say that no, he would run away from that situation. He would never accept praise or something, but this time, he allowed the people to praise him. Praise him in a very grand style. It's just like red carpet going into Jerusalem. All rows stopped. And everybody stopped. The Bible says that there were crowds coming from Jerusalem meeting him because they, they heard that the Messiah was coming. Now, that crowd, if you read the book of John, describes that those were the people who had heard about him raising Lazarus from the dead. And so they heard about this man coming from Nazareth. And so they were coming to see this wonderful man. Then those who were coming after him, they were coming from um, Nazareth, from um, Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. They were following him. And so this big crowd came, and all of them, just like pre-arrangement, they came together praising God. He never taught them what to say. He never mentioned that when I reach this place, then you begin to put your lapel down. He never pre-arranged it. They just did it automatically because God had pre-arranged that Jesus should be magnified Amen. as the Messiah. Hallelujah. When the time for your magnification comes, no one can stop. Hallelujah. When the time for your uplifting comes, when the time for your deliverance comes, no one will tell anybody to recognize that you received help from the Lord. Hallelujah. And those who ridicule you, those who look down on you, when the time of your glory comes, they will turn around and say, it is only God who can help somebody like this. They will give glory to God. Hallelujah. I know somebody in this church, the husband got sick, and even the doctors who were taking care of the man, they were so afraid that the man couldn't make it. 
The lady called me, we were working here at that time during the COVID time, and the lady called me and said that the doctor said that my husband didn't make it. I said, really? I don't believe it. So I told the people we were working with, let us pray. So we prayed here. Now the person who couldn't make it, he came through. And the way they expected him to suffer, it wasn't like that. They expected him to be sick for a long time. He got well in a very short time. Because he got help from God. So when God sets you up for progress, nobody can stop you. And those who are looking down on you, they say, hey, what are we seeing? We thought this could never happen. But look at what God has done. Wait for that day when people will say about you, look at what God has done. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So they started saying, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, our God. Hosanna in the highest. When you read the book of Luke, Mark doesn't say that. But he said that when the Pharisees and the priests heard people praising Jesus, they told Jesus, don't you hear what they are saying? They are calling you the Messiah. Stop them. That's blasphemy. He said that you want me to stop them? If these people stop praising me, the stones will start praising me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, Three of the Gospels, four Gospels, three of them says that Jesus entered into Jerusalem, went to the temple, and then there were money changers and those who sell doves. He drew them away, just took a, a belt and whipped them up and told them that this is my father's house. This is supposed to be a house of prayer and not a den for robbers. But in Mark, the gospel of Mark, it says that when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, it doesn't talk about whipping them and driving them away. That was the next day, according to Mark, that he did that. But Matthew, Luke, and John says that he did that the first day. But according to Mark, the first day, all he did was to inspect the temple. He did inspection of the temple. He looked around. It's just like you, you know, those of us from Lofa, you send money for people to build your house in Lofa in, Niger in Liberia, and then you've never been there. So you go back home, and you go to the house, they say your house, and then what do you do? You inspect. You look around to see that, your money really did what you wanted them to do. Do you know that at times you buy the most expensive zinc to roof your house? Then they take half of the money and buy the cheapest zinc. You know zinc? Okay. <laughs> and then they roof it with the bad zinc. So you go, you want to make sure that they put the right zinc there. You want to make sure that the windows are the right windows. So Jesus, coming into his father's house, had to do inspection. Looked at the pulpit. Who stands here to preach? What's his name? Does he preach good? Or he's just joking? Is he here just to tell stories? Talk about he being loaf man? I mean, what kind of message does he preach? And all he did inspection of that place. Now, I've come to tell you that if Jesus should come and make inspection, in your life, what will he see? If Jesus should come to your house to make inspection, remember he's the master of everything. What do we have that we did not receive? Everything we have belongs to him. So he comes to your house to make inspection. Looking at everything in your house, would, will he be proud of you? Do you have to do some cleaning before Jesus comes? He will come unannounced. He won't wait for you to pack all your, your shoes at the corner before he come. You'll be all over the place. Have you put your life in order? 
if Jesus should come and inspect your Christian life, your worship life, the way you live your life at home, at work, what will he see? Hallelujah. What about if Jesus come to visit your marriage to make inspection as to how you live with your spouse? How you live in front of your children? Remember, you can't hide from him. You push it under the table, he can see it. Nothing can hide from him. So today, Jesus has come and he's inspecting, looking around. This is supposed to be my father's house, a house of prayer, a house where people come and get their breakthrough, where people worship me in spirit and in truth. But that was not the last time. He is going to Bethany. He will come back. You remember the Bible says that when the evening came, he left the city. Jesus was a village boy. He will come to the city, do all the miracles, and then in the evening go to Bethany and rest. It was on those one of those journeys that he saw the fig tree that was a hypocritical fig tree. If you have leaves, you must have fruit. But he saw leaves, he was hungry, went to look for a, a fruit, and there was nothing on it. So he said, from today forward, no one will eat fruit from you. And the Bible says that the next day when he was passing, the fig tree had died to the roots. So Jesus came to Jerusalem, entered the temple, and made inspection. So let's assume he's in the temple now. This is his father's house. So if you are in the balcony trying to control the soundboard, you don't hide behind there and be on your phone watching football game because Jesus is watching and making inspection. We don't see you, but he sees you. <laughs> and if you come to church with ulterior motive, he sees you. He knows your heart. If you are singing in the choir, you want us to praise you before you sing your tune very well, he sees you. He understands everything. He's making inspection, inspection of our lives. When you go to work, the way you conduct yourself, is it the way Christians are supposed to work? Jesus is making inspection. Hallelujah. And we have to make sure that we will pass that inspection. So it's not only triumphal entry, going into Jerusalem, you come and sing hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. He's also coming for inspection. I told the first service that I pray to God that you should give me wisdom for one invention, one, only one invention, then I can die in peace. One invention. You know that invention I'm praying to God to give me wisdom? The invention that I want is to come up with something, a device, that I will put at this double door. A device. A hidden device. When you are coming in, then the device will say, hey. <laughs> with all those things that you did to your husband or your wife, you come in to serve me. <laughs> and it will show on this big screen. <laughs> do you think God will let me get the idea to do that? I don't think so. <laughs> and when you bring your tithes and your offerings, say, ah, with all the money you made, you think that's your 10%? When are you going to be faithful to me? You always bring one dollar, one dollar. Where is my tithe? Where is my offering? I, the day I invent that, you know that I was going to, you know. But Jesus has come for inspection. Remember, if you did not remember anything, number one, he has need of you. He wants to use you as a trophy. 
that everybody in your family will know that your help comes from God. You are not just an ordinary person. Yes, you are a member of that family, but you are special. God wants to set you apart. So he will do the impossible through your life. He will prearrange for your progress. Amen. Amen. Do you know that he can prearrange for you to be successful in school? I told the first service that when I was at the University of Cape Coast, I would be studying and I will hear from these big ears. You have studied enough. Go and sleep. And whenever I hear such a thing, I know I'm going to get an A. Because God has prearranged with the professor. The questions he's setting are the questions that I have studied. I knew that. And it happened several times for me. Prearrangement. Do you know that God can touch the professor's heart to the point that when he's setting questions you haven't studied, he will tell him that, no, this is too hard. Nobody can answer this question. Can you reduce the, you know, and that kind of thing. Just because of you. So when you go in there, there will be questions that you have studied. Amen. Amen. Do you know that you may be sick and you've gone from hospital to hospital, they've given you test or contest, and no doctor can even diagnose your problem very well. Somehow God can prearrange for somebody to take your case and give him the wisdom to really identify what is wrong with you. That is how God can prearrange. Some of us are here, not because we have relatives here, but somebody else prearranged for us to get here. Some of us, we got here, and God had prearranged for somebody to come into our lives and make life easier for us. I know somebody who came here and said that I suffered to be where I am, but so long as you met me here, I will make sure you don't make the mistakes I made. I helped the guy. It took me several years to buy my first house. It took that person, I think, three years, and he bought his house. Prearrangement. May God prearrange for your success and progress in Jesus' name. And may you live your life in such a way that when God comes for inspection, you will pass. You will pass the inspection. Because he is coming, you can't hide anything from him. And so you have to straighten up from now because he's coming. He's not only passing to Jerusalem. When he reaches the temple, he's going to inspect. The Bible says that, are you, don't you know that you are the temple of the living God and the Holy Spirit lives within you? And so you are the temple. And when Christ comes, he's coming to inspect your life. How you conduct yourself. Not only in the church, but at home. How you conduct yourself in front of your children. He will hold us responsible. May God help us so that when he comes for inspection, we will all pass. In Jesus' name. Shall we stand? Let's sing Hosanna in the highest again. our hands and just worship the Lord. Praise him and thank him that he has need of you. So he will prearrange and make everything work on behalf of you that you will be successful. God wants to use you as a trophy. Give him all the praise in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We lay down our crowns. We lay down our trophies. We lay down 
everything that belongs to us, our cloaks, and we submit to your authority in the name of Jesus that you rule and reign in every area of our lives. Father, we thank you that you need us and to show us for the praises of you. You have called us from darkness into your marvelous light. We thank you, Lord. The Lord, may you go ahead of us and prearrange for our progress, for our protection, for our safety in the name of Jesus. And we give you all the glory. We thank you, Lord. And we magnify you. Be glorified, even in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. At this point, if you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, talking about God, prearranging for his children, talking about God, having use of you, like has need of you to use you, you have to be his child. You have to belong to him for him to be able to use you. If you've never accepted Jesus as your savior, this is an opportunity. As we celebrate his triumphal entry into Jerusalem as the master of everything, as the king of kings and lord of lords, as the Messiah, this is the right time for you to give your life to Jesus. If there is anybody who hasn't accepted Jesus with all eyes closed and with all heads bowed, I want you to just raise your hand. It is very easy. God has already prearranged for your salvation. You just have to respond to it and submit yourself to Christ. Anybody who wants to receive Jesus as their Savior today, you don't have to do much. All you have to do is to believe and accept him. Hallelujah. Anybody? Anybody? If, if you have raised your hand, the Bible says that if you will not honor him before men, he will not honor you before the Father. So with all eyes closed, may you be seated with all eyes closed. If you have raised your hand, you can walk quietly in front and I will lead you to accept Jesus. It's very simple. He has done everything. Pre-arrangement has been done. Our sins are put on him already. He's the burden bearer. He will not count your sins against you. He will pardon. He will forgive and restore you. And from today, you can be sure that you are part of the kingdom of God. Anybody who wants to receive Jesus now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I thought your eyes were closed. All right. If there is anybody who wants to believe that your healing is also prearranged, I want you to come forward. It doesn't matter how, what you have gone through in life. Christ is available to set you free. If anybody has a burden, something they have struggled with, a load that is upon your shoulder that is weighing you down, that cannot let you get to the right place to serve the Lord. Remember the court was bound. If you feel bound by issues of life and things that are bothering you, your mental faculties are not working properly because of what you are going through, Jesus is here to set you free. And you can come believe in him for your breakthrough. It doesn't matter if it is sin or sickness or disease, Jesus is here to set you free. Now, all those who want to receive Jesus, I want you to just raise your hand. I'll pray for those who want to be healed. So I want you to say this after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. I thank you that Jesus died in my place. And he rose again for my justification. I believe he is the Messiah. He is my Savior. I pronounce him 
as my Lord. May you forgive me of every sin and cleanse me by the blood of Jesus. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. May the Lord help you in all your ways to live a life full of his glory. May he bless you and make a way for you, make the impossible possible for you to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. May he give you victory over sin and anything that comes against you. May the Lord bless and keep you and sustain you all the days of your life. Thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, to, let me pray for all of you too. Give me the oil. Jesus told his disciples that they should untie the cord and bring the cord to him. So as I anoint you with oil, the Lord is going to untie you from every sickness, every disease. If it is a spiritual uh, uh, oppression, may the Lord untie you. As I anoint you with oil, the power of the Most High God will come upon you and set you free. In the name of Jesus, any disease, any infirmity will be broken by the anointing in the name of Jesus. And the Lord will set you free so that you can jump around and praise him and glorify his name. And the Lord can use you for his own glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I anoint you as I lay my hands on you. May you receive divine healing right now from the top of your head healed in Jesus' name. I set you free. I break every yoke in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you are the great physician and right now I break every yoke, every obstacle, anything that holds the cancer, I break it and I set them free. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. Receive your healing and breakthrough and deliverance right now by the power in the name of Jesus. Be healed. In the name of Jesus. Anything that binds you, that holds you down, I break it right now. And I set you free. Your spirit, your soul, your body be broken and set free. That sin is walking in the business of life that Christ has called you. Be free in Jesus' name. I set you free by the power in the name of Jesus and by the anointing of the living Christ. Receive your His presence. Set free. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed by the power in the name of Jesus. your hands right now. Father, I thank you as your children raise their hands to you. I thank you that you are confirming your word concerning them. I thank you that those who receive you as their Lord and Savior, you're going to fill them with strength to live for you and to serve you. Those who are believing you for their breakthrough, their healing, their deliverance, your word says we will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Father, I pray that their bodies will begin to mend and get better. May their healing be manifested physically to the glory of your name. 
Every yoke spiritually or physically be broken by the anointing of Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that you stand by your word to perform. Receive your miracle. Receive your breakthrough. May you be set free. May every obstacle be taken out of your way so that you can gallop and glorify the name of the Lord. Receive your breakthrough and healing in the name of Jesus. I thank you and I give you all the glory for answered prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down.